Welcome to Mission 150, the podcast that tells stories from 150 years of Seventh-day Adventist mission to the world. To find out more about the mission of the Adventist Church today, go to AdventistMission.org. That's AdventistMission.org. Welcome to today's episode. I'm Sam Nevis. And I'm David Trim. And today we're going to be stepping out of history and back into the present. We've had several interviews with recent or current missionaries. And our guest today is already with me. It is, in fact, Sam Nevis himself. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, David. (laughs) Over the course of the many episodes we've recorded, some listeners have heard Sam talking about his connection with Brazil, his connection with Britain, and yet now he's working at the church headquarters in Washington, D.C. And some of the feedback we've had, and by the way, we appreciate the feedback we get from listeners. Some of the feedback is, tell us more about, you know, how does Sam get connected both to Brazil and to Britain? So, Sam, where were you born? Chapecó, Brazil. So that's in the south of Brazil, the state of Santa Catarina. Brazil has a little tip. I'm from the middle state in that tip. And the city that I grew up in until I was three is in Chapecó. So near to the Uruguay border? Yeah, a few hours drive from there. Down down in the south part of the country. All right. And tell us about your family. Well, my uh, mom and dad are, are a very interesting couple. When they met, my mom was 17, 18 and my dad was 57, 58. Oh, goodness. So there's a 40-year difference between them. And my mom had been uh, born out of wedlock, which at the time was a very serious thing. Very scandalous. And to make matters even more interesting, my grandmother is a Catholic Italian. Right Today she's an Adventist, but at the time she was an Italian, Italian family. They had a hotel in the city. And... My mom's dad, my grandfather, was a Palestinian tradesman. A Palestinian tradesman? Yeah. How interesting. So I have Palestinian blood. <laughs> <laughs> From my dad's side, I have Jewish blood. So I live the conflict within yeah. me. Right. <laughs> so it's right. both. Um, but then when my grandmother uh, became pregnant, my grandfather offered to marry her and take her back to Israel. Um, we ha- there's a village about 100 kilometers from Jerusalem that is basically my family there. Mm. But she did not want to convert to Islam. Right. So she rejected the offer and decided to take care of, of the child herself. Problem is, the family was too shocked and they didn't want to lose their stance in the community. Uh-huh. And they kicked her out. So uh-huh. she then moved to another city and had my mom and eventually got married to an Italian widower that had six children. Mm. And needed a wife to take care of all these children. (laughs) So they got married. And at some point, my mom came back and grew up with her family, her original family that had um, expelled my grandmother from the home. Right. So they welcomed her back. She grew up there with them. But she was always in search of a father and a friend. And when she found my dad, she found it all. You know, a father, a friend, a, a, a husband, all of it. And she didn't let go of him until they got married which was a shock to the city because my dad was the lawyer representing the solicitor that represented the city. So suddenly he comes up with an 18-year-old, you know, (laughs) engaged. It was a shock. Or buried. it was a shock to them. But eventually they got over it and they always wanted to have children. My mom always wanted to have children, even from the first, you know, from marriage. Right. And we don't know exactly where that love for having a child came from, but they couldn't. They tried and tried and couldn't until my mom started receiving Bible studies from an Adventist family, Hmm. met the story of Hannah in the Bible, and promised that if God gave her a a son, that she would dedicate that son to ministry in the Adventist church. Hmm. And... Was she an Adventist yet? At no, that point? she was a she was a Catholic still. Yeah, so she when she visited the Adventist church, they welcomed her and it was wonderful. But she was just a visitor. So when she became pregnant, she started to take this thing very seriously. And my dad was a lot harder to to teach because he had a lot of of mm. philosophy and theology knowledge and so on. But it took three pastors, and eventually, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he was baptized too when I was born. And that's why my name is Samuel, because of... Because of the story of Hannah. Oh, that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So 
you've been born and your mother has promised you to the Lord. Yeah. My mother did the same, by the way. Really? I didn't yes. know that, David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was born late in life when they weren't expecting any other children. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were difficulties with the pregnancy, and my mother promised me to God if, uh, if, if, if all went well. So, at any rate. And so, it did, and here you are. <laughs> and, and here I am. So, you've been promised to the Lord by a mother who's only just become an Adventist. What does that mean? What in practice does it mean that she that it means that she gives you to God? My dad was retired and earned a good uh, retirement pension. And my mom didn't need to work. So I had both parents through all my upbringing. Mm, that's wonderful. And my mom spent the days helping me memorize biblical passages. At some point, I had entire chapters memorized. And my dad and I like to talk about history and philosophy. So I grew up from three, four years old discussing history and philosophy at the table and memorizing the Bible. So that was a phenomenal combination, um, combination yeah. from, from the outset. But it really made a difference when I was about 12, 13, and my mom developed a vision that I had to go to England to study English because she believed I would have an impact in the mission of the church globally. Right. And which, without, is, which is probably true, but also is an extraordinary vision for a woman in a provincial town in Brazil to have. Yes. My mom has an eighth grade education. My dad is much more of a realist. She just, in her prayers, God put that in her heart, and, and that's what was going to happen. Now, how do you come from Brazil in the 90s to study in England? She wanted you to study as an Adventist, not just at, in, a, in a general boarding school. Yeah, and, and she heard about Newbold College. So it was going to be Newbold College, but I was 13. Right, so you, you, you're too young for Newbold College yeah. at 13. And when we came to uh, Utrecht, my dad... For the 1995 GC session. That's right. We went to the Newbold College stand, and they said, it's too young. Is there another school in England? No, there isn't. There was Stanbridge School. Yeah, there but, was. But the students that Newbold put there in oh, the stand. They didn't know. <laughs> they didn't know. So my mom was distraught. We know now. Yes. We know now. And she's like, but God said, that, and I'm listening to this, and we're being translated because we don't speak English, and we're translating it to them. And my dad spoke a little bit, so he was trying and back and forth. No, there's no other school. There's nothing we can do. She's like, but God, that destroyed her. So for the rest of the trip, it was just tears. Hmm. But the last part of the trip was England. And on the last day of England, we thought, there's no point going to Newbold. They already told us no. But we got f lost as a family. Oh. Uh, my dad went to park the car, and I w we were waiting in Buckingham Palace, and he didn't come back. And now we're waiting and waiting for six hours, you know, f from the change of guard at 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. I made one of those guards move. <laughs> you know, I came to one of them and said, Brazil family lost you, father, park your car, go away, no, come back. And then <laughs> the guard moved, called a taxi. I thought it was so cool. I thought it was in a movie. You know, we got in the taxi, we go to the Brazilian uh, consulate. Right. They were just about to close, but they really took care of us. Mm. They went with us to the police and to the hospitals. Nobody heard of, of dad. And they put us up in a hotel and gave us McDonald's. I couldn't be happier. <laughs> and this was Friday. Right? The next day, that Friday, we were supposed to get the ferry boat in the afternoon back to late afternoon to Belgium mm. and then get the airplane back to Brazil the next day. We had the passports. My dad had the money. Neither of us would go anywhere without each other. Right. And it was a very difficult night for my sister. I have a, a younger sister as well, just like Hannah in the Bible. God gave her mm. some children. He gave my mom and dad, my sister. So she cried all night, and my mom was, was in a very difficult situation. And then the next day in breakfast, after this B&B, &B, there's a public phone, and it rings, and my mom says, pick it up, it's your dad. Mm. And I'm like, no, mom, I'm going to say, well, hello, hello, I don't speak English. You know, <laughs> what am I going to say? Pick it up, it's your dad. And it was. Oh, amazing. He had made his way to Newbold College. Uh, he's a coronel, a military yes. coronel. And for him, this was a, the, the point of, of convergence for us in this new, new territory. It was Newbold. So that's where he was going to go. 
he found the address from the... But he didn't tell you. No. At that point, he was lost. Oh, so he was because lost. Because he's oh, lost. Right, right, right. It's like, where am I going to go? Finally, he made it back to Buckingham Palace, but we weren't there anymore. No. So where is he going to go? He's going to go to Newbold. So he makes his way through Friday night, True. asking people from, there's no devices at the time. So that's right. He's making his way on the map to Bracknell, asking drunkards, you know, <laughs> 2 a.m. in London. <laughs> Eventually, he makes it to Newbold, and that's where he meets Brother de Oliveira, Japheth de Oliveira's uh, dad. Yes. <clears throat> who connects with the airline. Is Portuguese or Brazilian? Brazilian. Yeah. Brazilian. So he calls the airline. The airline gives the phone number of the hotel. He calls the hotel. When we meet eventually for lunch that day, Brother de Oliveira says, yes, there is another school. It's called Stamber School. Picks up the, the booklet, gives it to my mom, and the dream is back to life. Mm. They go back to Brazil. She convinces my dad to sell the house, a series of miracles there as well. And they sell their house and send me to study in England wow. because I need English in order to be a missionary. And you were, what, 14 by this time? 14. Mm -hmm. How did you feel? I was excited, you know, uh, going to a new country to study. And, and yeah, I was, I was thrilled. Three months later, I wanted to die <laughs> because I'm wearing, you know, a tie every day. And it's an, you know, an English education. And it's gray and rainy at times. Yes. Cold, colder than in Brazil. I, I had never imagined that sunset could be at 3.30. No, I, a similar experience for me when I first went to, to England, having grown up in Australia. It was right. like, how can the sun be setting already? I, I was in a physics class the first day, and I am, I'm watching the sun set behind me. I'm in the last seat, and nobody cares. And I'm like, Jesus is coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's 3.30, it's dark. Anyway, eventually I adapted to that uh, reality there. But I grew up there. I, I spent three years at Stamber with 40-something nationalities, almost mm. 50 nationalities. And there were only 200 students, 250 students. So being exposed to, to the world in my teenage years yes. was of paramount importance to my potential as a missionary because you understand cultures very differently. Right. And you live with them at that early age. Exactly. And there's nothing like actually living cheek by jowl with people in a, in a men's dormitory yeah. <laughs> for, for, for promoting intercultural understanding. Right. So I finished. I went back to Brazil. Um, I started... And you, so a large part of it was learning English, presumably. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which at that age is quick. You know, within three, six, right. three to six months... I, I loved it, but at three months I hated it and I wanted to go back. And this was the, the most difficult part of the journey for my mom because I called my dad and said, I need to go back. I can't take it anymore. It's too much structure and order. And, you know, there are 29 <laughs> bells all day that keep ringing to tell me what to do. I can't take it. Take me back. And he was very happy to take me back because he never wanted me to come in the first place. Oh, right. This was very much your mother's dream. Oh, yes. And then I called my mom and I said, Mom, I need to go back. No, you're not coming back. And with zero tact at all. She's like, no, you're not coming back. I said, Mom, but I, I'm going to die if I don't come back. Well, then you die. And I'm like, Mom, <laughs> you are not coming back. God gave you a mission, and you're going to finish that mission. Wow. You need to stay until you finish, and you need to learn English right. because you were dedicated for ministry, and, and this is it. And at that time, I, I bought into the dream that my dad set up, which was to be a diplomat. Mm. You know, when I was 11, he went to visit the local conference president and said, how much do pastors get paid? I need to know more about this. My son wants to be a pastor. He came home and said, there's no way you can be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and he convinced me to be a diplomat. And at that point, that's what I wanted. And English would fit with that. Yeah. But there were two sons of missionaries there. At Stamborough. At Stamborough. Their, their dad was in Albania at the time. Mm. And they were there studying as you've mentioned in previous episodes, when missionaries go to different places, there are boarding schools that they go to. This was one of them, Oliver and Jonathan. And they were Brazilian. And God used them not only to convince me to stay, but God used words that they said that led the Holy Spirit to have such an impact on me that I went back to my original goal of being a pastor and never looked back since. It's right. those boarding school moments that mm. God transforms you in very simple dialogues, and then he just speaks to you so powerfully. And that's what happened there. So you've gone back to Brazil. Is that where you did your first degree? Yes. 
so I went back to Brazil to do theology. It was very helpful. Uh, four years, I did all three emphasis, systematic theology, biblical, and pastoral care. Um, at what was the university? UNASP. At U, the, the main Adventist university in yeah. Brazil, for people who don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been to school in England, you've come back and done your first degree in Brazil. How do you end up going back to Britain? I was dating this girl called Amy, who I started dating when I was 15 at Stamber. Mm. And we didn't know if we were going to be together or not, but we kind of left the options open. You know, let's continue. She, I tried to break up with her. She said, under no circumstances. <laughs> so she rejected the idea. And eventually, we, we got engaged. So you'd kept up the relationship by mail? Yes, very difficult. And at this point, uh, what was it called? Hotmail gave you access to oh, yes. instant messaging. Yes. And that was a game changer because you didn't need to wait this for the letters. This is the late 90s. Yes. So then in one of those trips, um, Stambrook Church, I think it was Patty Boyle, the pastor, invited me to preach. And I preached about the second coming and I told part of my story and so on. And the local newspaper, the Watford Observer, uh, covered the story and printed the story. The BUC... That's the British Union Conference, yes. for those who don't know. Yeah. They invited me to an interview that they recorded, and then the conference heard about me as well, and Don McFarlane at the time had a talk with me about potentially coming to... The South England Conference. To the South England Conference, yeah. They would sponsor my master's, and I would work there. And I said to him, absolutely, that would be a dream. And... He said to me, well, we need to wait for the committees to meet yeah. next year when this happens and so on. And I told him, look, I have a deal with God. The first call that, I, that comes, I will take. And afterwards, I heard that uh, Patty and others talked to him and said, you need to call this boy. You know, the, he, we, need, we need him here. Earl, the treasurer, did not want to lose Amy because she worked at gifting oh. department <laughs> in treasury. <laughs> so he told me later, my motivation had nothing to do with you. I just didn't want to lose her. Um, long story short, I don't know how Don pulled it off. I think he just signed a letter. I never asked him afterwards. But he took the responsibility for getting this approved in the committee. And I, had, I came back to Brazil in my end of my third year with a call to have my master sponsored in England, which was an amazing opportunity for me. Right. And that, in fact, for our listeners and viewers, is where we met because I was teaching at Newbold College. Yeah. And uh, I taught you a master's course on theology of min mission and ministry. That's right. Uh, which I co-taught with, with colleagues. And so that is where Sam and I first met. Right. So you've done your master's at Newbold. Now you have to go into pastoral ministry. Tell us about that. Holloway Church was my first church as an intern. So a big church in London. Big church in North London, inner city, uh, 381 Holloway Road, in fact. It's right outside. It, it was very, <clears throat> very different to what I expected in many ways. I also had Muswell Hill, a smaller church. Yes, I and, preached there, actually. Yeah, and I was, I was blessed to have um, Emmanuel Osei, one of the pastors there, former president now of the, of the conference, and Sam Davis, also former president of the yes. conference. And Sam took to my preaching, so did the church. So I had the opportunity to preach a lot in Holloway Church. And that was great because I, I developed a love for Caribbeans and Africans. Uh, they, they listen to sermons differently. They engage with preachers differently. And it gave me a great opportunity to learn that kind of preaching. Mm. And then I was given a Wimbledon International Seventh-day Adventist Church as a senior pastor. And they had 56 nationalities there. So it really was an international church. Yeah, and, it, and it, it was amazing. I loved every moment of it. And you've often talked about it, actually, used it as a reference point in our podcast. Yeah. So after Wimbledon, I went to Stamborough to be an associate pastor there. This is, for people who don't know, is kind of the headquarters church for Adventism in Britain. And I loved it. Um, and that's, while I was there, I was called to the General Conference, which was a great surprise to me. Right. Why were you called to the General Conference? I often wonder that because uh, it, was, it was a very odd call. Usually in, in Adventism, you spend your 20s in a local church, your 30s in a conference, your 40s in a union. If all goes well, your 50s in a, in a division. And if God calls you to the General Conference, it will be in your 50s and 60s. Um, so 
to be called at 33 from being an associate pastor at a local church to an associate director of communication at the General Conference was a very odd call. Mm. And I think it's part of a, a, an overall desire, not just of administration, but communication itself, to restore our missional focus. So communication in the last 20 years has been, <clears throat> or before then, was very much a public relations and crisis management and, and news. corporate communication and news and yeah. so on. And that came in some detriment to the missional opportunities of right. social media and, and the new emerging digital world. So what do you do with a denomination that with an, ins with an administrative unit, the General Conference, who does not communicate with local church members or the general public for since its inception, pretty much? The General Conference communicates with its unions and divisions. Yes. And it, it does its work through its divisions. But social media now meant that every department and everyone here now communicates through the social media channels directly with not just members, but, you know, uh, uh, future Adventists, let's say, people yeah. that are not part of the yes. church at all. And I am part of that, of trying to make sense of that. I think my call had a lot to do with, let's take this young pastor who understands about communication really well, who has... Um, is more of a native to this world. And let's see how we can uh, develop ways of, of the church adapting to this new reality, right. this new technology. And what you've left out is that when you were pastoring in Britain, you got quite involved in media yes. and, and, and using digital platforms. Right. So it's not like the, the, there was no basis for calling you, though, <laughs> though, though it, is, it, is, it, it was a big transition. Yes, um, but nevertheless, there, there was a there was there was a, there was a logic to it. <laughs> um, it, it wasn't madness. It was there was, or if there was, it was a method in the madness, as, as, they, as they like to say, because you had been quite involved in media outreach. Yeah. Um, looking back, what has been the challenge of working interculturally and internationally, and what has been the benefit? It was. It took the Mission Institute to help my family understand that we were in fact missionaries. Because when you go from Britain to the, to, to the US, you kind of, you know, there's a general expectation that, you know, you're not in the mission field really. Right. You know, it's a, you're just. It's comfortable. It's comfortable. And mission is not supposed to be comfortable. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the Mission Institute really helped us understand that, that we are in fact missionaries and our mission is the world field. You know, I don't, feel a mandate as part of my ministry to reach the Americans that live here. I do that as part of my uh, of being a Christian, as part of being an Adventist, but personally, as other members of any church have that responsibility to reach their, you know, their communities. But my ministry and the ministry of my family, because we see ministry as a, as a family, right. is to reach, <clears throat> is to help the church uh, not just globally, but also within a digital mm. landscape. So cyberspace, some, some, since the 80s, that, that, that sentence has kind of stuck. And others prefer the digital world. I prefer the digital world. So there is a mission to the digital world that I believe God has called me to help us navigate. And there's also a mission to the different cultures of the world mm. as we interact with them. And these new digital technologies means or, or, or has come to mean that an 18-year-old in Seoul, Korea, in Sao Paulo, in New York, in London, in Paris, have so much in common with each other because they're watching the same videos, they are exposed to the same kind of storytelling, and, and they are so connected that now culture also has an age dimension. Later, they will have a lot more to do with their parents than each other. But at that age, they have a lot more in common with each other in how they see the world uh, than perhaps with their parents and grandparents, which adds another very important layer of, of complexity to mm. all of this. I, I feel that God has prepared me to serve in where I am now from a very early age. Yes. In every way. You know, and, and we, we only have a few minutes here, but... You know, I could write a book about the different ways that my upbringing helps me to navigate the complexities of, of 
mission uh, to this new world and, and to be a missionary today Yes, in that sense. Well, you've certainly had a remarkable career, thanks partly to your, your mother and her... A hundred percent. ...and her vision. Sam, last time we talked about mission bureaucracy, what has been your experience of the mission bureaucracy as someone who's moved between countries and continents for the church twice now? Coming to the General Conference was, and I know it wasn't the same in the past, but when I came, we felt as a family that we were cared for like this. And in fact, every trip, every interaction for the first few years, there was a profound sense of the church is entrusting me with a serious responsibility. And because of their love, I need to do my best. And at the time, Johanna, um, one of the people here that was working in HR, and the entire secretariat department, everything we needed they were very helpful in providing. And I mentioned last time that when you were interacting with the organization, with the people in the organization, they are the custodians of how we feel the 20 million Adventists relate mm. to me. And this was, I, I cannot describe properly into words the feeling as a family and personally of being taken care of by the bureaucracy. When the bureaucracy is there to absorb as much complexity as possible so you can focus on the mission, there is a profound sense of, of being sent, of being in, empowered and encouraged by millions of Adventists. I only interacted with 10, 15, but it felt like the millions of Adventists were behind me, like a, like a powerful wind, you know, propelling mission for us. And, and that is... I can imagine what missionaries feel around the world when that happens well, which is my case, but also when it happens badly, because I also heard many stories of, of when this does not happen, yes. when they feel lonely and, and nobody cares, it seems, which means that we need to be extra careful everywhere that involves missionaries and people that are sent for mission so that the bureaucracy is not there to overpower and to... Because bureaucracy can be... This really oppressive thing. Yes. Well, you didn't fill the form, so no. Yeah. You know, or you, and sometimes that is the case. Sometimes you did not fill the form because you did not pay attention and you suffer the consequences of it. And there's nothing that anybody can do. And that's part of the process. But bureaucracy is not there to oppress. It, bureaucracy is there to empower and to encourage. Mm. And when it's done properly, it's beautiful for the missionaries. Thanks again for joining us in this episode of Mission 150. Please keep watching on AdventistReview.tv or on the Seventh-day Adventist Church's YouTube channel or keep listening on your favorite podcast platform. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends. If you want to know more about Adventist missionary work and missionaries today, go to AdventistMission.org. And if you want to find opportunities for service in mission today, go to vividfaith.com. We'll be back next week with more on the inspiring history of Adventist mission around the world. Mm -hmm.